Hi, everyone. We're back. We now, um, it is election day, and I've been telling everybody that I talk to, just try not to think about it and focus on something really fun. So today we've got this awesome lecture. Mikhail Shapiro is here from Caltech, and he's going to tell us a really interesting lecture about biomolecular ultrasound. So go ahead, Mikhail. Great. Thank you, uh, Kim and Keith, for having me in this class. It's really fun to be here. Um, I agree with Kim 100%. Just you know, focus on something fun um, and focus ultrasound neuromodulation is spelled out F-U-N. Um, so that's an ideal topic for this, uh, for this just today. So uh, the topics I'd like to cover today um, are mainly focused on controlling the activity of uh, neurons uh, with ultrasound uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about imaging um, as well. And, I, and before I do that, I just want to say broadly, my background and what our lab works on to give you context for, for the things I'll show you. So we're broadly interested in imaging and controlling the function of cells deep inside the body. This includes neurons in the brain, but also microbes in the guts and immune cells elsewhere in the body fighting tumors. Um, with the idea being that we need ways to study these cells within the context of intact living, breathing animals uh, and all the physiology and other cell types that are present there. Um, and ultrasound is a fantastic way uh, to do that because it's one of the few forms of energy that is more or less unobstructed in going into at least soft tissues. Uh, so it can be used for both imaging and control. Uh, and the work in our lab pretty much breaks down into sound waves and magnetic fields, using them for imaging and control. And the, the crux of what we want to do is to actually connect um, these forms of energy and these modalities to cellular function, ideally through genetically encodable mechanisms. So just like for light, there exists GFP and optogenetics, uh, which are proteins that can emit and receive light and do things in the cell. Uh, we want to find similar things that can do uh, with uh, ultrasound or with magnetic resonance. And of course, for obvious reasons, today I'm going to focus on the ultrasound part of it. All right, so on the modulation, um, the, this course is, is on ultrasound neuromodulation. Um, I don't think I need to explain uh, why it's interesting. It's already been covered in previous lectures. I just would say that um, I'm totally bought into the idea that it's interesting and exciting. Uh, and so if we can really do it and understand how it works, uh, it has a lot of potential because both for animal research and in uh, clinical translation, there's already a clear path um, that it could follow. Um, uh, the, the work it, it, at Caltech, so both in my lab and with the collaborators that are listed uh, in the bottom right here, uh, which includes neuroscientists and mechanical engineers and biomedical engineers and chemical engineers, um, is to try to understand how does focused ultrasound interact with the brain and with the cranium, and how does it inter interact with neurons on a couple of different scales. So both on the whole cranium scale and on the, on the brain circuit scale, and also on the cellular and molecular scale. And so we do work for both in vivo and in vitro. Uh, and for our in vivo work, uh, one of the interesting things we found over the last few years is that there appear to be sensory side effects um, that come into play when you're applying focused ultrasound to the brain. It depends a lot on the parameters you're using, whether you're doing repetition, or you're doing continuous ramping, et cetera. Um, and it seems to come uh, based on our recent computational modeling from the um, skull bone acting as a shear wave conductor um, that can, even though you're focusing on a certain region, bring some of that um, acoustic energy into other regions of the head, for example, into the, the ears. Uh, I'm not going to focus on this uh, part of things today. Um, I think probably you're getting that covered in, by, other, uh, by other speakers. Uh, but if you'd like to, you know, certainly you can look up some of the papers um, we've written about this. But I guess uh, opinion-wise, I would just say I think there is, uh, there are sensory side effects um, and we need to understand them. And it's the same as with any other neuromodulation techniques. So TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation has pretty significant side effects. I've had TMS done uh, to me um, and I know how, how it feels. Um, and you, you need adequate understanding of those side effects and you need good sham control um, to be able to interpret your studies. Um, what I'd like to focus on more uh, in depth is the in vitro part of what we've been doing. We've been trying to understand the molecular and cellular mechanisms. And this includes both um, kind of the biophysics of what's happening uh, and also how that biophysics translates into interactions um, with and between different types of molecules. And this is the, the kind of the genetic component that I think I've been ta tasked with talking about. And then I'll talk about this investigation of, with uh, neuromodulation that's being applied to unmodified neurons. And then I'll transition to talking about sonogenetics, which is the idea of overexpressing or expressing 
um, heterologous, meaning from other species, uh, proteins inside of neurons to get them to be extra uh, sensitive to ultrasound to try to, to be able to control genetically specific neural circuits. Um, and you know, I think ultimately where you know, we'd like to see this is, is that I, my personal opinion is that a lot of the currently used parameters in the literature of ultrasound neuromodulation are creating both direct modulation and some kind of sensory uh, side effect. And by understanding each of these things, hopefully we can get to parameters that give us more direct modulation and less of the uh, side effects um, and allow us to create appropriate controls. So most of what I'll talk about on the in vitro side is the work of Sang Jin Yu. Um, he's a postdoc uh, in our lab. Um, he did his training in um, uh, neuroengineering at KAIS and Korea. And um, he, so he came in with a lot of knowledge already about neurons. He worked on electrical interfacing with neurons. And so we kind of tasked him, uh, or he and I tasked each other with trying to use some of those kind of techniques to try to figure out what's happening uh, with ultrasound. And so the results I'm gonna show you are coming from this kind of setup, um, this picture in the upper left-hand corner, where we have primary dissociated neurons uh, from mouse cortex that are growing on a mylar film which is uh, more or less acoustically transparent. Um, there is ultrasound coming from below. All the experiments here are done at 300 kilohertz, which is kind of in, within the range of what's being uh, been done um, in in vivo literature. Um, and there's an optical objective that's looking at these neurons, and the neurons are expressing uh, fluorescent indicators. Uh, for example, GCAM6F, which is a calcium uh, sensor. So you can look that, that look at the calcium dynamics inside of these cells. And um, the reason we designed the setup the way we did is we wanted it to be uh, as realistic as you could uh, for um, an in vitro preparation in terms of mimicking in vivo conditions. So what I've seen a lot of people do in their studies is like grow the neurons on a plastic or glass substrate. Um, and I think that creates uh, a mechanical conditions that are quite dissimilar from what you have inside of the soft brain. So ideally, we want to get away from that. So that's why we're culturing these on mylar film. And I should say that in addition to this setup, we've also done experiments where um, we've cultured the neurons inside of a, a pretty thick layer of uh, collagen. Um, so now they're really in the soft environment that mimics the mechanics of the brain. And we also see the same kind of responses that I'm about to show you here. Uh, and so we apply ultrasound to these neurons. We actually angle the, the transducer at a bit of a tilt to try to minimize standing wave formation as much as possible. Um, and the parameters uh, Sung Jin used in these experiments were continuous wave excitation um, and um, a range of uh, intensities that translate into amplitude. This is what the focal spot of the ultrasound transducer looks like that we're using. And so the first news that we saw that, that was good news uh, from our perspective is that there is a, a pretty robust response. So this is looking at uh, GCAMP signal in these neurons. So this is before ultrasound starts. By 0.1 second, you can already start to see some brightening uh, in here. And then it kind of peaks out at about two seconds to five seconds where you get this maximal response. And about 15 seconds later, it dies away. Um, I think I have a, a video here that I can show. Um, so we're looking at these neurons. They have some spontaneous activity. And then when ultrasound is applied, you see this kind of larger and more synchronized activation. So that, that happens uh, quite robustly. Uh, we can quantify the GCAMP signal um, as shown here and basically you know, see how it depends on intensity and pulse duration. And basically the more intensity you have, the stronger uh, the calcium response, both in terms of the magnitude of the average response for the area under the curve or the response probability of what fraction of the neurons are responding. Um, and the longer the pulse duration you have, also the more robust the responses. And that's you know, no surprise. I think it's, it's consistent with what people have seen in vivo as well. So now that you have this like very good optical access to what's going on, you can also look at kinetics of the response. Um, and so um, showing um, here in the bottom, we're kind of looking at, um, sorry, you can move something over here, uh, at kind of what's the delay in the response. Because it doesn't happen right away. And it seems like if you look at the time scale bar here on the bottom, it's, you know, it's about 100 milliseconds. Uh, type of uh, delay before you really start seeing a response. And we can map by looking at uh, the activity of individual neurons um, and create a fit of the onset time, the time to half maximum and the peak time. And so if you look at kind of the averages of those, the, the typical onset time is in the range of uh, 0.1 to 0.15 seconds. So 100 to 150 milliseconds. 
Um, <clears throat> and it uh, decreases somewhat with uh, the increased intensity. Um, and the time to half max also accelerates as you have increased intensity. So you both, have, when you increase the intensity of the ocean, you both increase the response magnitude and the probability, and you also make it happen faster. Um, so this is good. This means the neurons are responding. You know, obviously here there's no sensory or auditory system at play. So this is a direct response uh, to the um, to the ultrasound, which is great to see. So now, what are the mechanisms? And the the mechanism that uh, I'm sure you've heard about already from other guests in this class is um, uh, different possibilities. So there could be thermal mechanisms. So here, looking in the top left corner, you could have mechanical force, um, or you could have something that involves bubbles, either bubbles outside the cell or bubbles that may be forming inside the, the lipid bilayer, as been hypothesized by some people. So we wanted to kind of look at each of these um, and see how likely is it. So temperature, most people in the ultrasound neuromodulation field kind of say it's unlikely to be the mechanism at the parameters that are used. Uh, because there's just not enough energy being deposited. And indeed, that turns out to be the case here. We have a very sensitive fiber thermometer that we use to measure this, and we get tiny little elevations of temperature. Um, and another way to look at temperature is actually taking advantage of the known temperature sensitivity of fluorescent proteins, like M-cherry, uh, which is not calcium responsive. And you can see that it's pretty much flat. So you really don't get uh, much of a temperature involvement. Now, how about cavitation? That's a little bit trickier uh, to look at and to be totally conclusive. So one way to look at it is just see if like degassing the hell out of a solution makes any difference at all. We, we don't expect this to be cavitation versus no cavitation, but at least if it's important, then the, there might be some difference there. And so this uh, data in panel D here is basically looking at that and saying that doesn't, it doesn't seem to make a difference in terms of the response you get. Um, another way to look at it is actually try to look for bubbles with your own eyes. Uh, and so here we borrowed a 5 million frame per second camera from our aeronautics department suspended it over our water tank with the ultrasounds and the uh, neurons. And we're, we actually try to look at, and you can see the time scales involved here uh, on a very fast time frame. Uh, and we, we have videos of this uh, in our bioarchive uh, manuscript, but so these are just a couple snapshots where we're looking at the peak positive and peak negative part of the pressure cycle. And so both in this zoomed out view and this really zoomed in view on the single neuron, we don't see any bubble formation or evidence of bubble formation or cavitation inside of these cells. So at least there are no bubbles that are like microns in, a micron in size that we would have been able to see with this technique. It still doesn't quite rule out the possibility that there are nanoscale bubbles that are forming transiently inside the lipid bilayer. But at least we can say that they're not forming all over the lipid bilayer because then in aggregate, it would, it would look different. I would expect it to look different uh, optically. So, so that means to me, it's unlikely that it's cavitation. And I'll, I'll, I'll give another, um, piece of evidence for why we think it's unlikely that this int int intramembrane cavitation hypothesis is at, is at play here. Um, of course, the other, the other force here is the mechanical force. And so there we can also look at these images and see, do we actually see any kind of deformation in these neurons? And from uh, all the videos we've acquired at these very high frame rates, we don't see any obvious deformation uh, of the cells. So that means that if there is mechanical force uh, at play, that the deformations it's causing are very small. Um, so if you know if the deformations are on the scale of ten, tens of nanometers or smaller, we wouldn't be able to see it with this optical method. Um, so potentially in the future, you know, you'd need some other way to look at it. But um, we, we what we decided to do is to, to kind of look at involvement of mechanics and see if we can change the mechanical properties of the cell and see if it makes a difference. Uh, and so one of the ways to do that is to affect the actin cytoskeleton of the cell. So here. In the bottom, we're looking at actin stains in these neurons. And we use this drug called cytokalasin D, which basically depolymerizes the cytoskeleton, the actin cytoskeleton. So now you've broken it apart. And we can look and see what kind of difference does it make in the response to ultrasound. And you can see that it doesn't like completely eliminate it, but there is a statistically significant response. And so that gives us a clue that uh, mechanics are involved in this and kind of motivates us to further study mechanical things like mechanosensitive ion channels. Um, oh, another you, question. Uh, did you image the motion of the membranes or, or what those cells did in response to the ultrasound like you did with the control? Like, did they move less? Or oh, interesting. Yeah, for the cytokalasin depolymerized cells? No, mm -hmm. we didn't, uh, but that's would a great you idea. expect them to be more uh, rigid or more flexible? I, I would expect them to, well, I would expect them to deform more with, if, if I'm poking them with something. Um, in response to the ultrasound, you know, I'm not sure I, I would see anything, you know, mm -hmm. based on, on what we saw already. So 
but it's, I, it's a good experiment to do. Um, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, so we should try. It. Yeah, but I, I think like so when you when you disrupt the the side of the the axon side of skeleton, it it changes the mechanics of the of the cell in terms of um, kind of what happens when you push on it. It also changes its interaction the interaction between membrane proteins and the side of skeleton. So for some things like mechanosensitive ion channels, for example, sometimes they're anchored to the side of skeleton. So this disruption doesn't necessarily, the, the, the effect that this actin disruption has on the ultrasound response doesn't necessarily mean that it, it has to do with the bulk mechanics of the cell. It could also mean that it's through some kind of interaction with some of these mechanosensitive ion channels that's being affected. Uh, Kim, I saw you. Uh, yeah, no, I was just thinking you. that it, it is sort of um, uh, it, some, similar to what Scott Hansen was talking about when he was talking about how sort of the, the lipid membrane becomes um, uh, less stiff or it allows <laughs> the, the proteins to move around in the lipid membrane mm -hmm. under the presence mm -hmm. of ultrasound. So it just sounded sort of similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, um, that's possible. Um, so, okay, so then the other thing we wanted to just kind of check is whether synapses are involved in this. So is this something that, that is based on the interaction of two neurons with each other, or is this response something that's neuron autonomous? And one way to check that is by blocking the synapses. So we have a, a cocktail of synaptic blockers that we use, and basically it didn't make any difference. Uh, and so this to us suggests that the response, like every neuron on its own is responding uh, to the ultrasound. Um, all right, so let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, and so there are a couple additional questions I want to ask. So one is, um, is this involving kind of ion channels to get to the response that we're seeing? Um, and so one way to do that is to look at, at uh, voltage-gated sodium channels um, that you can block with TTX. Um, and uh, you see that that uh, greatly reduces, but does not completely eliminate the response of the neurons to ultrasound. So what that means is that um, that if you have these ion channels that can produce action potentials, that the ultrasound is likely uh, causing action potentials to get triggered, and that's creating these large responses that we see here. But if you take away the action potentials, you can still get calcium entry into the cells. It's just not enough to create an action potential uh, on its or or it's not creating an action it, it's not creating an action potential on its own when you've blocked the action potential producing um, ion channels, uh, and then. Uh, you can wash away and partly recover the response. So, so this is telling us that like the, the large response that we see is involving action potentials being generated, uh, but we want to investigate a little bit further. So one of the limitations of calcium imaging is that like you need to have calcium enter the cells for you to, to see it. So if you want to study the involvement of calcium in the stimulus response, then it, it becomes a little bit tricky. So one way to um, get around that or get an additional view is to measure voltage changes directly. So we use this uh, genetically encoded voltage indicator, ACE neon green, um, which uh, sits inside the membrane of the cell uh, and changes its fluorescence directly in response to depolarization, so changes in, in membrane potential of the cell. And so here with this uh, indicator, we can directly see that you're getting depolarization in response to ultrasound. Um, these uh, indicators are much noisier than the calcium ones. They just haven't been optimized as much yet. Um, so you can see it's noisy, but you can very clearly see this uh, kind of response. And you can uh, try to look at the response delay in this case. And it seems like it's also kind of on this 100 millisecond uh, type of time scale. So, this, so these kinetics are, are pretty similar to what we see with calcium. Um, and one of the predictions of the membrane cavitation theory is that you should have hyperpolarization preceding depolarization. So we would have expected to see a negative uh, dip, and we don't see that uh, anywhere here. So that's uh, kind of another thing that makes us uh, be a, uh, a little bit doubtful about, about the membrane cavitation um, hypothesis. Okay, but the, the perhaps more important um, experiment that now we can do is we're looking at voltage directly so we can manipulate extracellular calcium and see how that affects the response. And so here in this bottom right panel, we're removing the extracellular calcium. And now when we apply ultrasound, we don't see the depolarization response, okay? And what that's telling us, so we don't need the calcium for the imaging in this case, we can see the voltage directly. So when we remove calcium and we no longer see the response to ultrasound, that's telling us that the entry of calcium presumably through some kind of ion channel or maybe some other mechanism, is essential 
for activating the response to ultrasound, which, which gives us a, a clue that we should be looking for a calcium channel or some other kind of calcium entry mechanism. Does the, uh, does the hyperpolarization that I'm seeing in the bottom right uh, suggest that like <laughs> potassium channels are opening up in tandem with the calcium channels or, or am I just not like, is that real that dip? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, you know, I think it might be like with the, with the um, kind of uh, noise level that we were getting, it's hard for us to make the call that there is hyperpolarization there, but you're right. It does look like there might be a subtle uh, hyperpolarization. So, so yeah, you're right. So there could be uh, some kind of potassium uh, channel mecha uh, mechanism involved there as well. Yeah, I think, so we're actually currently uh, trying to use a, a next generation voltage sensor to make this even cleaner. And um, he, and I think that hopefully would let us see more cleanly if there is a hyperpolarization. Yeah, well, I mean, also consider that these cells are probably hyperpolarized already to some degree. So the effect is gonna be much smaller than depolarization. Mm -hmm. But to me, if you put a high pass <laughs> filter on that data, it's like, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm taking a All shot right. in the dark here. It feels like that's definitely good. You got to pursue. We're excited okay. to see yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm totally open to that possibility. Um, so I think it would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So, uh, okay. So to us, at least, we interpret this as saying that, you know, calcium is a major driver of this kind of response. And also from the previous slide, the cytoskeleton disruption gave us a clue that kind of mechanics are involved. So, what we want to look at are um, mechanosensitive ion channels. And, and in this case, we're looking at ones that from the literature are known to be expressed to at least some level in uh, mouse neurons. Uh, and so this is kind of like a, the list of suspects uh, that we went after. Um, and there are multiple ones. There's even a G, G protein called the receptor um, that's, that has been hypothesized. Um, and so we want to examine all of these. And the basic idea is like, to see, first of all, are mechanosensitive channels involved? And then if they are, then try to narrow down which ones they are through a combination of pharmacology and genetic methods. So um, starting with the kind of broadest pharmacological approach, we use gadolinium, which blocks mechanosensitive channels. Um, when doing gadolinium experiments, you have to be very careful because if you have a high enough dose of it, it'll just block everything. But we did titrations and looked at effect on spontaneous activity. And so here we're using a, co a concentration of gadolinium that should be selective to blocking mechanosensitive channels. And, but it, it's not specific to any particular one. But when we apply the gadolinium, we see this very significant reduction in the response. Okay, so that's, that's giving us um, evidence that mechanosensitive channels are involved uh, in this response. Uh, now with that, we can try to go after more specific ones. And so here first, Sungjin used pharmacology. So ruthenium red blocks uh, channels in the trip V family, one, two, and four. When we apply ruthenium red, we don't see much of a difference. Um, GSM uh, uh, TX4 is a toxin that blocks both piezo channels and trip C1. Um, and when we apply that here on the bottom right, we see a small but statistically significant reduction. And again, we're using these um, uh, um, pharmacological agents at mild concentrations because we don't want to have like non-specific effects. So even if we see small but statistically significant responses, we're, use, we're treating that as a clue to tell us that these channels might be involved, but as you'll see, we're following up on later on. Sorry, Mikhail, quick, quick question. So these are cortical cultured neurons still, right? Do, do these cells um, and all cells of the brain express at least a little bit of all of these channels or are these selectively high expressors yes. of piezo and trip and the sort of thing? They're, no, they're not. So, so the, the, what we looked for was uh, evidence in the literature and the Allen Brain Atlas, and in some cases we stained for, my, uh, for ourselves that these, these channels are expressed to at least some level. Okay, so, so we could assume that the rest of the brain might also express some low level um, of these, these channels as well. Uh, you don't have to say for sure, but probably. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. but you don't have to assume. You know, you, I think for a lot of them, you can look it up. <laughs> on the Allen Brain Atlas now and see. Um, so, um, yeah, so at least, at least in these cells, they, they seem to be. Uh, and then uh, GPCRs don't seem to be involved because we can block GPCRs from the intracellular space um, and we don't see uh, any effect. So, okay, so what, where that leaves us is it gives us some clue that either piezo or trip C1 might be involved, but we still have some channels over here um, that are not subject to selective pharmacological blocks. 
uh, and they might still be contributing to some of the response. So to tease these apart further, then we need to turn to kind of more heavy duty genetic methods. Um, and so here we use uh, CRISPR, uh, which I'm sure everybody has heard of. You have to be like living at the bottom of the ocean uh, not to have heard about it. Um, but it's basically a, a convenient way to modify the genomes of cells. And so we're gonna use that in this experiment. So Sangjin designed a way to use CRISPR to knock down the expression of these different channels. Um, and so the way that works is you transduce the cells with a viral vector that includes, it, it expresses this Cas protein, which can, with the help of a specific guide RNA that you can design to target the specific ion channel of your choice, will go in and make a cut in that DNA in the genome. And that can disrupt uh, the expression of that channel. Um, and it's not um, 100%. So like when you're, when you're applying, because you don't want to overdose these neurons with virus because then it becomes toxic for them. So when you do these knockdowns, you actually end up at least like with the generation technology we're using here with knockdowns that are like 25 to 45 or 50% efficiency of knockdown. Okay, so you're not completely eliminating the expression of these channels. So it's kind of similar to the pharmacological things we were, we were using in a way that we're still looking for reductions. We're not looking for a complete elimination of the, of the response. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very selective tool because now you're going after specific channels. So now using this, we can look at each of these channels and try to get a little bit more specific. So TRIPM7 was one that we could not block with pharmacology specifically, and that does not seem to be significantly involved. Um, Piezo1 doesn't seem to be involved very much. There's maybe a little bit of a trend there, but we don't see <clears throat> that much of a difference. And it could be because it's not sensitive to these parameters, or it could be because it's just not expressed very much in these neurons. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not part of their part of their response. But we have a couple of channels that do seem to be very significantly involved. Uh, and that's uh, this combo of TRIP-P1 and TRIP-P2, which is pictured in the upper left here, work together uh, to act as a mechanosensitive ion channel. Um, and uh, TRIP-C1 also seems to be involved to a significant extent. And we can actually look at the magnitude of these changes when we do the knockdown. Uh, relative to the knockdown efficiency that we had with each of these constructs and kind of rank them in terms of how important they are uh, for, this, for, for this response. So it seems like TRIP-P1, um, uh, sorry, TRIP-P2 has the strongest response. And then, you know, TRIP-C1 is also involved uh, potentially to some extent. And could you um, potentially find a common domain between all these TRIP channels and do uh, a whole knockout of all of them? You know, I, I, I like visually mm. just setting up the effects and saying, okay, we could probably get rid of it entirely, but there must be yeah. a, a strategy for all of them, right? Yeah. Well, what you could, what you could do is you could, you can use multiple guide RNAs. Oh yeah. That would, same, that at, would be at the, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, so we still need to do that. I think that's an important experiment. And also we, we actually, frankly, want to get a more complete knockdown of each of them uh, because this is not a, this is not a hundred percent effect at this point. Right. And I, these results are beautiful, by the way. Weird comment, but this is just thank you. absolutely amazing to, to well, say. Th you know, thank you. Yeah. All, all, all credit to Sungjin. So, um, yeah, I think and this was, uh, as you might imagine, just like a crazy amount of work. I know. Oh, my God. I'm seeing all these figures and all these knockdowns. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. OK. So. All right. So this, this gives us a clue that these are the these are channels that are involved um, and it lets us start kind of getting a mental picture of what's going on. So, so one thing about the channels that I just, I just showed you, so these mechanosensitive channels, is that they're all letting in calcium. So that's consi consistent with our the kind of previous experiments that showed that calcium is required <clears throat> for this response. Um, but we're wondering if, they, if there's also potentially some kind of amplification happening downstream of that. Um, and in particular, uh, there is this class of channels that TRIP-M4 uh, is part of that are calcium gated sodium channels. Okay, so these are channels that when the calcium concentration reaches a certain threshold inside the cell, open to let sodium enter, and now sodium will flood in and, de and depolarize uh, the neurons. Okay, and these are actually used in sensory systems like neurons in the, in the retina. Um, you express these trip M4 channels and so on. Uh, and so they can act as amplifiers because basically you can have enough calcium entry to trigger a trip M4 channel that wouldn't have been enough to depolarize the cells to enough of a level to open voltage-gated channels for an action potential. Okay? But if you reach enough of calcium to activate a TRIP-M4 channel, 
then it kind of bridges the distance because then it lets them sodium to depolarize and then that can trigger voltage gated sodium and calcium channels to get you the rest of the the rest of the depolarization and lead to an action potential so um so uh, we also knocked out uh, trip M4 and saw this um, significant reduction here. So um, it kind of made us suspect that that's also involved. Again, keep in mind, this is a partial knockout. Um, and then um, there are also uh, kind of um, calcium channels that are particularly voltage sensitive that can also be part of like the pathway for entry of calcium after you start getting depolarization. And so um, this, uh, this channel also seems to be uh, involved. Um, so the picture that we have, and I think there's still a lot more to confirm and study about this, is that you have ultrasound that's somehow um, causing mechanical deformations. They're very small, um, but they're sufficient that they trigger the opening of some of these uh, calcium permeable mechanical sensitive channels. Calcium starts accumulating. That accumulation can take place over you know, 10 to 100 milliseconds, but eventually reaches enough of a level that you can trigger uh, calcium sensitive uh, sodium channels, like trip M4, um, that will amplify that signal uh, to the point where you trigger action potentials. And then you get this uh, kind of burst of action potentials that, you know, if you look at these kinetics, then takes place over a few seconds uh, kind of time scale until the system re relaxes back to equilibrium. So that's, that's our kind of current mental picture of what's happening in endogenous neurons. But of course, now that we see which channels are involved, we can ask the question, like, can we increase this response by overexpressing some of these channels. And so that's what Sangjun did as well. And so in these experiments, basically took trip C1, trip P2, and trip M4, um, and see if we can sensitize the neurons uh, above wild type uh, to respond to um, ultrasound. And, and for, for these three channels, that, that works. So this is looking at overexpression. So this actually goes to Keith's earlier question. So even in wild type neurons, when you stain for these channels, you see some level of expression. And here we're increasing it through overexpression. Um, and then, so these are the time courses of response. So you can see that to a, a small extent with trip C1, but to a larger extent with trip P2 and trip M4, you can significantly boost the response to ultrasound uh, across the different intensities of ultrasound that are applied, which means that um, either you can, in theory, you could just get more response in neurons that you're genetically modifying or you could try to find an intensity that's giving you very little response in neurons that are wild type, but will give you a sufficient response to activate neurons that are genetically modified. So it could give you some of that sonogenetic uh, type of specificity. Um, also interesting is that um, trip M4, uh, if you're expressive, seems to accelerate the response. So the latency decreases uh, when you overexpress trip M4, which is interesting to see. Mikhail, do you, I don't know if you're going to go into this, but I want to make sure the students learn about it. Um, do you talk about the genetic targeting of these channels in the human brain, even using ultrasound in, in nanovesicles or can oh, you yeah, yeah, this yeah, so therapeutically I'll, useful? Yeah, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make we're sure. Not doing it, we're not doing it with these channels, but I, but I will talk about introducing genes into the brain with the help of ultrasound. Great. Just wanted to make yeah. sure we covered it. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I love this stuff, but in, in, in some ways, the, like, the stuff I'll show with using ultrasound to introduce genes from a therapeutic point of view could be easier to see getting really implemented. Uh, but we, we can talk about that when, when we get there. But for now, uh, you know, we're here in this case, we're typically using either AAVs or lentiviruses, which are two very common gene delivery vectors uh, to deliver these genes into, um, into our cultured neurons. Um, so, all right, so this is a glimpse that something like sonogenetics is possible. Okay, so the idea that we can overexpress something that can sensitize things. Now here, um, we're limiting ourselves to just overexpressing things that are already there in the neurons because we're interested in sonogenetics, but we're also trying to, you know, prove our hypothesis that these channels are important uh, in the ultrasound response. But you don't have to limit yourself uh, to that. So that brings me to work uh, not from us, but from a couple other labs that I wanted to mention, um, and. Um, so people have been thinking about sonogenetics um, for a few years. Um, and that, kind of the idea that the way I think about it is like ultrasound is capable of doing all these different things um, that um, you guys and other speakers here know much better than I do. Uh, but there's potential ways to couple uh, um, genetics to each of these categories in the context of neurons, both kind of pushing um, and heating um, could be mechanisms for doing it. And we'll talk about how blood brain barrier opening uh, can play a role as well. 
So on the mechanical sonogenetic side, uh, the first study that I'm aware of was done for, in the lab of Alan Liu at Michigan, who's a mechanical engineer. Uh, and what they did was have uh, cells, these are re uh, RPE cells, just a, a cell line um, that have microbubbles next to them. And they overexpress uh, this uh, ion channel MSTL. It's a mechanosensitive channel from E. coli that the E. coli used to respond to osmotic stress. Um, and so um, Alan and, and, his, and his team expressed this channel, overexpressed this channel uh, in the cell line, and then they apply ultrasound. And the ultrasound is causing displacement of the microbubbles. Okay, so it's pushing. Uh, on the bubbles, and the idea is that that, that pushing can distend the membrane and activate uh, these channels to open. And they showed that quite nicely in vitro uh, in their paper. And the, the the way they were showing that is that these channels actually, when they open, are large enough that small molecules like the fluorophores can get into the cell. Um, and so that's what they were showing um, with this um, idea. So this was uh, in 2014, um, and then uh, shortly. Thereafter, um, there was a separate approach um, that I think a lot of people have heard about by Shrek uh, Chalasani and his team, where they did this in a um, living animal, a C. elegans worm. Uh, and the idea is very similar in that. So here again, they have the living worms, they have them on a Petri dish, and they have microbubbles next to them in the Petri dish, and they're using the microbubbles as the transducer of acoustic radiation force that's gonna act on, um, on these, uh, in, initially just on the worms. Uh, but what they found, and, and um, I'm just pulling out a couple of things from their paper, is that there's a particular ion channel, TRIP4, that's endogenous to the worms, that seems to sensitize the worms to the mechanical stress of the microbubble displacement. And the, 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 the way this is used genetically is that once they found that, they could take that TRIP4 channel, put into neurons that normally don't express that channel, and normally don't respond to ultrasound and get those neurons to respond to ultrasound. Okay, so that was their demonstration and uh, Shrek um, kind of called it sonogenetics, uh, it sounds pretty cool, uh, and it kind of captured people's uh, imagination. So, so this is a, a great demonstration. Um, I think the you know, obvious limitations here are that you know, these are conditions that'll work for a worm, but I'm not prepared to like bathe in microbubbles uh, to be uh, stimulated, uh, and nor is it easy to deliver microbubbles in vivo to see it. So one, of, so one of the questions is, you know, can you get responses without uh, microbubbles uh, there? Uh, and then could this be done in a species like a mammal um, that uh, maybe has a different way of sensing mechanical phenomena? Okay. Um, so, and that created like a lot of people are working on this. I know there's, you know, uh, work at Stanford and, and uh, other places, and I've seen a lot of claims of people doing sonogenetics effectively uh, without microbubbles. I haven't yet seen very robust responses, in my opinion, like uh, behavioral responses in animals. Um, I think because we also know that ultrasound can modulate neural activity on its own, there's a lot of potential for confounds, and you have to be like super careful to claim something that's happening uh, in vivo. Uh, but having said that, there is there is exciting stuff happening in the field. Actually, I just wanted to, to uh, tell the students that Sh uh, Shrek and his team recently put a, uh, something on BioArchive um, where they tried to extend this into mammalian cells. And so what they did is they built this uh, setup where they're applying ultrasound to cells. This is a, these are HEK cells, the mammalian cell line, just like uh, at, on the glass cover slip. So again, that's like not my favorite um, setup from a mechanical point of view but they use this to screen through a bunch of different ion channels, like a, more than a hundred different ion channels from various species um, to find ones that conferred more response to ultrasound uh, to these cells. And they found this human uh, homo sapiens uh, trip A4, uh, sorry, uh, trip A1 uh, channel as showing the maximal responsiveness uh, in the setup. Um, and then uh, introduced that uh, uh, ion channel genetically into mice. This is through intracranial injection. So this is an invasive way uh, to introduce it. And they're showing that you get kind of more mechanical responses from some of the limbs of the mouse uh, when you apply ultrasound. Um, uh, so this is just an example of the kind of studies that are out there. You know, I think this is a, a, a good step. I mean, it's cool to see the screening of different ion channels. I think all of us would agree um, that these kind of responses are kind of underwhelming 
um, that you're seeing kind of small EMG responses. You know, if you think back to um, when optogenetics was being introduced, you put a fiber in and turn it on and the mouse runs around in circles um, or like <clears throat> runs to one side of the room and just wants to stay there and not the other side of the room or whatever. Um, so hopefully at some point on genetics, we'll get to the point where we have that as well. Um, kind of from an opinions uh, point of view, I would say, uh, I think there's still a lot of mechanistic investigation. It's not at all clear to me, like mechanically, how these channels are responding in these kind of setups that you have in vitro, you know, you have a seven megahertz transducer, um, you know, you could be getting uh, streaming effects, you could be getting some kind of substrate deformation, standing waves, uh, which are all cool, you know, but I think we need to figure out exactly uh, what's going on there and how that relates to what you'll see uh, in the brain. So you would argue that some sort of like highly rigorous, but very fine tuned behavior would be the best, like something like left turn versus right turn, um, rather than, you know, broader behavior like feeding or. Oh, I think those are great too. I think feeding would be totally fine too. Yeah. I think like, you know, and I, you know, I'm not a card carrying neuroscientist, so you have to ask the neuroscience uh, yourself or neuroscience colleagues, like what's the, what they, what they consider an impressive behavioral response that would make them actually want to use the technique. Um, but yeah, I think like um, the standard ones people have used for neuromodulation methods are either motor um, or they are um, uh, like um, memory based or preference based. Like, you know, you, you, you can um, apply stimulation to a reward region and like reward the mouse being in one place and not the other and show that it has a conditioned place preference. Uh, but I think, you know, feeding and those kind of things could be great as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah. But anyway, I think there's still a ton of work to do here. I'm just showing this as one one example. And there's there's kind of an increasing number of papers that are coming out on this. But to me, what's exciting about it is that there's progress being made and there's, there's still a ton of unanswered questions and nobody has yet found like the answer that works very robustly. So it's still um, kind of the prize is still out there for the students who are listening. Uh, to go and, and, and work on this. Um, at the same time, so there's the thermal mechanism, um, and this is actually uh, has a pretty long history. So um, uh, Kurt Moonen and his team back in 2008 had this PNS paper, and they actually had some, some literature on this before then, uh, basically using heat to activate gene expression. So here they used HSD, which is heat shock promoters in cells. They had a mouse, the genetic, uh, um, uh, transgenic mouse, that has luminescence uh, with the phrase expression under an HSP promoter. So when the cells get heated, they'll start expressing a luminescent protein uh, and basically characterize like how much you have to heat uh, to get activation of that luminescence expression. And you can do the heating um, with ultrasound under MRI guidance. Uh, and I know I'm in the presence of one of the uh, kind of um, parents of that, of that whole area, uh, but here they're doing it in the mouse. Uh, and, and show that that leads to expression. So at the top here, you have the temperature uh, profile that was attained uh, under MRI guided um, ultrasound. And in the bottom is the subsequent luminescence image. So they showed that you can use ultrasound to trigger gene expression. And so the question is, can you connect this to neural activity? And one way to think about it is actually through gene expression because it's also a way to modulate. But another way is to use temperature sensitive channels. And so there's been some work on this. Um, one of the most recent ones is from Hong Chen. Uh, it's also by archive manuscript. So basically the idea here is that you're overexpressing uh, trip V1, which is a temperature sensitive ion channel. And when you reach a certain temperature, it starts letting in calcium. Uh, and so now you can use acoustic parameters that you know you can, you can gear towards temperature elevation. So they're different from the ones that are used normally for neuromodulation. You have a longer uh, transmit uh, time and perhaps higher intensity and higher frequency. Uh, and they showed that they can express this channel again with a trans intracranial injection in mice and by doing imaging um, of calcium responses in these animals, they see that they have some degree of activation. Um, and again, here, I don't think they, they reached a very um, dramatic behavioral response, but it's showing you know, a proof of concept for a thermal mechanism uh, that you know, can be developed in parallel with the mechanical ones that we just talked about. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about some of those, we just, just wrote a review 
uh, for Neuron, uh, where we covered a lot of these kind of technologies. And, and um, I think there are some opinions there as well, um, that uh, additional ones from the ones I'm just discussing now, that just can give an overview. And we actually tried, to, we purposely tried to cite a lot of these bioarchive manuscripts because, you know, that's like some of the freshest stuff is there for people uh, for people to look at. Okay, so the last thing about the, the, the on, on the modulation side is about introducing genes uh, into the brain, right? So we have sonogenetics or some other kind of techniques. Um, how can we how can we get them in there? So we got into this kind of following again in the footsteps of um, many giants in the ultrasound field um, to use ultrasonic blood brain barrier opening to introduce a way for us to modulate neural activity. And we kind of took a step back and said, okay, what are the elements of really good uh, neural control like that you might want to use in a clinical setting. You don't have spatial control to target particular brain circuits. Um, you want to have temporal control. And ideally, you want to have molecular control, meaning that you're hitting a specific subset uh, of neurons based on their molecular characteristics. And so how can we do that? Um, so for the spatial, we're going to use ultrasonic blood brain barrier opening, which I assume is covered by other people in this class. True? Yes. Okay, great. So I won't spend time saying that. Um, the molecular side we're doing with viral vectors. Um, so the ultrasound is going to open the BBB and we're going to have viral vectors enter at that location. Now the viral vector gives you molecular um, specificity because the genes contained in this viral vector can be under promoters that are only active in excitatory cells or inhibitory cells or dopaminergic cells. Uh, and there's kind of a, a lot of technology developed for being able to do that. And then the temporal control. Okay, so in this case, what we thought is for the temporal, in some cases, you don't want to be walking around with an ultrasound transducer on your head to give you the temporal control. So instead, we want it to be pharmacological control. And we can achieve that through hemogenetics, which I'll explain in just a second. So this is kind of the package, and we call this acoustic guitar hemogenetics. Uh, and this was work that was led by Jorge Shablovsky, who uh, is now a professor at Rice, um, doing some of this kind of stuff. Um, OK, so ultrasound BBVO, I'm going to skip because you guys have other people covering it. Um, so. In terms of viral gene delivery to the brain, uh, we're using AAV, adenosine virus, um, for two reasons. One uh, is frankly that it's small, and so you only have to open the BBB uh, to some extent uh, to let it in. You know, these things are about 20 nanometers in size, um, and also they're already used in human gene therapy um, in other contexts. So it's a, it's an established safe. And the idea with these viral vectors is that they're non-replicating, which means that they'll introduce the gene of interest into the neurons, but will not uh, introduce genetic information to make more of the virus. So that's what gives them their, their safety in these kind of applications. And they have a certain carrying capacity. So in, within this amount of gene genetic space, we can put in the cell type specific promoter, as I mentioned, and our gene of interest. And so our gene of interest in this case is chemogenetic receptors, which are um, uh, receptors that you normally find on neurons, but that have been modified genetically so that instead of responding to neurotransmitters, they no longer respond to neurotransmitters, and instead respond to a designer drug that is systemically bioavailable and can get into the brain, but itself does not act on anything else in the body. Okay, so you create a lock and key type of mechanism. So we encode this receptor, in this case, these GPCRs, G protein coupled receptors called DREDs, that have been used extensively in neuroscience um, into our viral vector. And if these get expressed somewhere, then subsequently our temporal control is going to come from administering these drugs, CNO, clozapine, et cetera. And so the way this works when we combine, and I know I'm going to run over a little bit on time, so don't worry. Uh, um, so uh, the way these work when they're combined is that you have this brief CBV opening. Uh, this usually lasts no longer than uh, 10 minutes. Um, you have the viral vector that enters during that time. You give a few weeks for it to get expressed in the brain. AV actually, once it's expressed, can stay expressed for several years. This has been shown in a variety of, of um, medical translation studies. Um, and then whenever you want to turn on or off that brain region, uh, you just give that pharm pharmacological agent. And the, the reason I say on or off is because there are different versions of chem chemogenetic receptors that can be used to excite neurons or to inhibit the neurons. So when you're Putting, deciding what you put in your viral vector, you can choose which one you have. And so uh, practically, we implemented this in mice. Um, so BBB opening, you can see on MRI with gadolinium. Uh, in our case, we wanted to see if we can affect memory formation. So we did BBBO in several sites in the brain to try to cover the hippocampus in the mice. And we see this very nice BBB opening in that pattern, uh, again, performed under MRI guidance. Um, and the gene that we're introducing is uh, an inhibitory 
chemogenetic receptor so that when we give the drug, it's going to inhibit the neurons, which we're introducing under promoters, it's going to cause it to be expressed in excitatory neurons in the hippocampus, okay? which means that when we give the drug, we expect to shut down the hippocampus. Okay? So after doing the BVB opening, interesting virus, a few weeks later, we can also uh, uh, euthanize the animals and we can look at the pattern of gene expression that we achieved. And you can see here that we're getting pretty nice coverage of the hippocampus, both the ventral and dorsal uh, parts of it. Uh, so that's good, we're getting nice expression. Uh, and we're getting cell type specific expression. So if we look at like inhibitory versus excitatory neurons, we're getting expression specifically in the excitatory uh, ones based on our promoter. Okay, so now we have the spatial and molecular specificity. And so what kind of effects can we get with this? Okay, so now we have mice that have been treated with this procedure and we're doing a, a paradigm uh, called fear conditioning where the mice are getting uh, little uh, foot stimuli that are aversive to them that they don't like and they remember, so that if you put them into the same context uh, sometime later, they'll have this very characteristic freezing behavior that you can easily quantify. So meaning that they're forming a memory here and you can test their recall of that memory over here. And what we hypothesized is that in mice that received the uh, BB opening viral vector, if we inject them with the drug that activates that chemogenetic receptor, that will inhibit the, the hippocampus, and we will reduce the memory formation that happens here, okay, and we can quantify that. Uh, and that indeed turned out to be the case. So here, in terms of this context freezing that happens in the recall, in mice that were treated uh, with the CNO, the drug, uh, they show this dramatic reduction in the freezing behavior. And we can also check in a separate context that the mice are still able to run around. So we did specifically inhibit the memory formation and didn't just mess them up in some other way that prevents them from exhibiting their behavior. And they, actually the magnitude of this effect is pretty comparable to what people have done with either um, surgically injected chemogenetic agents or with optogenetics. So it seems to work pretty well. So, so we like this technique uh, because um, it kind of uses the beauty of, ultra, of ultrasound and that it gives you this like spatial targeting deep inside the brain, um, but doesn't require the ultrasound to be there all the time. So in a, you can imagine a clinical context for epilepsy or something like that. You know, if you can make the subsequent treatment as easy as taking a pill and still have the ability through pharmacology to modulate the timing and the dosing, just like you do with a normal drug. But now that drug is specifically acting on a subset of neurons in a certain location uh, of a genetically defined type of neuron. So now we're doing a lot with this. We're trying to um, do this in monkeys. We're trying to improve every aspect of the technology, the viral vector, the way we do the ultrasound, the genetics themselves. Uh, and I think this will be complementary to the sonogenetic approach because the sonogenetic approach in theory could give you much faster control time scales, uh, right? The drug, usually you're talking about like tens of minutes to hours uh, time scales with the uh, sonogenetics precisely you could do much faster. Okay, so that's the control part. And I realized I totally ran out of time on uh, imaging, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but um, I would point students to um, this uh, review article. We're interested in this. Um, so that the half of it is about um, imaging. Um, and if you guys would like, I'm happy to send you like a lecture that was previously recorded on the imaging um, that you could share with your students as an optional thing that they could look at. Yeah, actually, that'd be great. Okay. All cool. right, that was awesome. Thank you guys. Thanks very 